Do you want me right down there? Do you have it? Oh, there's our offering plate. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Come have a seat. Hi, guys. How are you? You, like, you guys all look great. We have a green dragon over here, too. Did you notice Cyrus's green dragon? Isn't that neat? Thanks for bringing your green dragon to share it with us. We appreciate it. Oh, it's not. I'm so sorry. It's a triceratops. I stand corrected. Thank you very much for teaching me. Thank you. Thank you for bringing him. He's beautiful. Thank you for sharing him with us. Hey, everybody. Can you tell me what these are? Glasses. Glasses. What are they for? Why do I have them? Okay, yeah. You have weak eyes, you need them to read. You got it, exactly. My eyes don't always see exactly what they should see. My eyes aren't perfect. But when I put these things on, I can see what's real. Oh my gosh, yes. And a little googly. It's like, it's like, sometimes I put on my grandpa's glasses, but I don't need them. But when I look down on that part, it just makes it look a little blurry, but if they were right for your eyes, you would see things clearly. Yeah. All right, so now in our Bible story, that's today, our Bible story is all about that, seeing things clearly, seeing things for what they really are. So here's a story. This is called the story of the transfiguration. Now, that's a big, huge word, isn't it? Transfiguration. It's not a big word. What do you think it means? Well, transfiguration means it's something like something gets changed, is what, it, or we see it for what it really is. It's like, it's like, it's like transfigure. It's like, um, it's like you change into something else. Okay, pretty good, pretty good, yeah, pretty good, yes. And, and you like change your, your, your anger. Okay, things can be changed. We see things for really what they are. So here's what happened in our Bible story today. Jesus took some friends of his and he went up on a mountain. Have you ever been up to the mountains? I have. You have? Maybe like to go camping? Yeah. Okay, so they spent the night, yeah. Um, once, well, I really don't remember this. My, my mom went up, well, we, my whole family went up to hike and oh, yeah. other mountains. Okay, I love going hiking. Yeah. So Jesus and his friends, Peter, James, and John, went up to the mountains. And they stayed there at night. They were going to stay out there, kind of like camping out at night. So here's what happened. They all began to fall asleep. It got a little late. Show me what it looks like when you're a little sleepy. Evie, what does it look like when you're sleepy? Yeah, kind of like a, yeah, so they got kind of sleepy. But then something happened. They were kind of sleepy. And then something happened. What happened was that they saw this light. And it surprised them. Show me what it looks like when you feel surprised. <gasps> exactly. They were surprised. Because what they saw was Jesus' clothes turned white. Like really bright. It was like a big white light was coming from him. Sun. Yeah, kind of like the sun. But it was shining from him. So they were surprised. And you know what? How do you think they felt? Happy. Happy? Yeah. They were, it was a little odd. They were happy. Okay, very good. They saw him. But you know what else they saw? And this is kind of weird. They saw two other men from the Bible. They saw Moses. Remember Moses? He gave the Ten Commandments. Yep. And then they saw Elijah, who was a prophet. And they saw Moses and Elijah, and they were there together with Jesus. But here's the weird thing. They had gone to heaven, Moses and Elijah, years and years before. So how do you think the disciples felt then? What do you think they looked like? Maybe a little scared. What does it look like when you're scared? Yeah, that's exactly how the disciples because looked. I, um, once we had a snake in our kitchen too, and mm. I, my mom was in front of us. Mm -hmm. and she literally screamed. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. I know you had an experience with a copperhead too. I saw that. I remember seeing those pictures. So they were afraid. They were afraid. Okay, and then you know what else happened? Even after that, they heard a big voice. They heard a big voice. And it came, hmm? Aha, very good. What do you know what the voice said? 
It said, this is my son, listen to him, listen to him. So you already know whose voice that was. It was God. And you know, why did he tell them that? He that wanted. Amen. Excellent. Excellent, Dalton. They could not be scared. They knew then that it was the Son of God that they were with. So they knew not to be afraid. So you know what? This story is like my glasses. You know how? Because they helped me to see what's real. And that big event that we call the Transfiguration. That helps us to see what's real. That helps us to see Jesus for who he really is. Okay, that Jesus is the only son of God. That was the point of the whole story. That's why God had that happen. So that the disciples there could know that Jesus was the only son of God. They could see Jesus for who he really was. So how about a prayer together? Okay, let's pray. Repeat after me, dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that Jesus loves us. Thank you for sending Jesus to come and save us. Help us to listen to Jesus and help us to see what is real. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks. Go back to your seats. And... You guys are going, where are you going? You're going that way, okay. And who is my reader this morning? Ah, there we are. Let's bow our heads for the prayer of illumination. God of transfiguring light, Show us your word as we read the words of scripture today so that your will and way can illuminate our paths. Amen. First lesson today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6 from the uh, New Revised Standard Version. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 9, two, verses 2 through 9. I invite you now to listen for the word of God as it comes to you through the reading of the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud came and overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord.
This morning we are coming to nearly the end of the first quarter of the church year. That's hard to believe, isn't it? It seems only a very few weeks ago from the beginning of the year that started with Advent back at the end of November, beginning of December. And Advent, our church year, started with expectation, with hope, and with getting ready. It seems a very short time from then to now. Now, some of the first words we hear each year in Advent are those words of John the Baptist, that voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, get ready, repent. Indeed, those are the very first words in Mark's gospel account on the life and ministry of Jesus, the same gospel account that we've just read from, the same gospel account that we get our scripture lesson from this morning. Today's chapters, today's lesson, is just nine very short chapters from those Advent words uttered by John, prepare, get ready, repent. And those same words told the world to get ready for something incredible. And so this morning, we get it. We get that incredible thing. In this story, there's something truly amazing that happened. And it happened on a mountaintop in Lower Galilee, in Israel. And that something is called the transfiguration of the Lord, when a whole new thing was revealed. A whole new thing was revealed to those who were gathered around Jesus. And the thing that was revealed was the true nature of Jesus as the Son of God. And the disciples who were there with him could never, ever be the same. Now, you may have seen the videos on TV or on the internet, maybe on Facebook, uh, of people who have undergone surgery or who have been the recipients of some great modern technology that has opened up a whole new world to them. Some of you may have seen that uh, footage, the videos of the man who couldn't see color, but who, after some intricate eye surgery, was fitted with a special kind of glasses that en enabled him then to see color. And the look on his face as the bandages are removed and the glasses are put in place, that's powerful. Or maybe some of you have seen that delightful, that really beautiful, touching footage of the baby girl who was born deaf and after surgery, she got cochlear implants and she could hear the sounds. She could hear sounds for the first time. Her sudden awareness and that huge beaming grin, that wonderful smile, demonstrate without a doubt her absolute astonishment, what she's now able to perceive for the first time. Suddenly, things are revealed for what they really are. Well, suddenly the three men on that mountaintop with Jesus today, Peter, James, and John, they were astonished at what they saw. They were astonished at what was revealed to them suddenly. What had been right before them for so long was something that they didn't perceive. It was something that they had not perceived until that moment. As the scriptures put it, the truth had been veiled to them until then, until that moment. Once blind, now they could see. And Mark records, Mark records in his gospel that they were blown away. They didn't even know what to say. They were terrified. Now, I'm sure we can all recall moments like that from ourselves. I'm speechless is our response. We may even tremble. We may even literally shake at the power of some great truth when something that we had not known is suddenly made known to us. The truth may have been there all the time, but as Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians this morning, it has been obscured, it has been veiled to us behind some curtain, hidden from us, usually because we refuse to see it, often because we are looking the other way. We're distracted by the hocus pocus of the world. We're distracted by all the other things we would rather see that may seem more comfortable to us to see. We're distracted by all the magician's tricks of those who are in opposition to truth, those who stand to lose if we really do see the truth. 
if we really do see things what they, for what they are, situations, people, other people, even ourselves. Do you remember that scene in The Wizard of Oz? That scene in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy and her companions, the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, and the Scarecrow, they're in that frightening chamber of the wizard, and there's blazing fire, and there's puffs of smoke, and there's a scary face that floats above what could almost be an altar. And there's a booming voice telling them, I am Oz, the great and powerful. Yet Toto, Dorothy's little dog, senses something else is going on. And Toto begins to tug at the curtain of the booth that's off to the side. And in that booth, there's a stooped man, hard at work, spinning dials and pulling levers, frantically trying to control and desperately trying to control the image. And the booming voice commands them again, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Well, it certainly wouldn't be to the advantage of the great and powerful Oz, who has ruled with an iron fist and who has kept his subjects deluded for years with lies and parlor tricks and by diverting their attention from reality. It certainly wouldn't be to his advantage. In fact, he would lose all his power if he were to be revealed for what he truly is. But at last, the curtain gets pulled back and he is exposed for what he truly is, wizened, washed up, yesterday's marvel, a fraud, a deceiver. And his power is suddenly gone, poof, as suddenly as one of those great big puffs of smoke. The delusion is shattered, and the four friends can no longer believe in him. They can no longer rely on him. They must change when that delusion is shattered. Now, on that mountain where Jesus was, that mountain where Jesus took his friends, something else marvelous happened. Something truly miraculous happened. The gospel tells us that Jesus was transfigured right before them, right before their very eyes. His clothes grew so white that they were whiter and brighter than any bleach could have ever made them. And a light, a light shone from him. That light actually emanated from him. <laughs> no wonder they were terrified, wouldn't you be? No wonder they were speechless. How fitting, how fitting that this account of this light comes at this point in the life of our church. See, we began this immediately preceding time to today. We began that with Epiphany, in which a great star shone the light of God towards a humble dwelling to point the way of Jesus. But this time, the light of God comes from within Jesus himself and points to pl the place where God indeed dwells right there, right there in the person, in the being of Jesus. It wasn't a light shining to a stable to show where God was, but it was a light shining to Jesus, shining from Jesus to show where God was, where God is, and to show who God is. And the disciples hear their own booming voice, telling them in no uncertain terms, this is my son, the beloved. And it is not the voice of a phony wizard, it is the voice of God. Well, that's transfiguration by definition. It's a revelation of truth, a showing of something for what it really, truly is. But notice the distinction. Transfiguration isn't transformation. Jesus wasn't transformed into something else. Jesus wasn't changed at that moment. How he looked to the disciples and how the disciples perceived Jesus, that was changed. Jesus was revealed. Jesus was revealed without question for his true nature, the Son of God, the Christ, the way, the truth, the light, 
the light itself. And it's a pivotal moment. It is a pivotal moment for the disciples. It's a pivotal moment for their world. It's a pivotal moment for the world. Slowly, slowly the truth becomes clear to them. Sort of like me putting on my glasses as my eyes adjust. Slowly the truth becomes clear to them. And the scriptures tell us that when he was transfigured, the disciples saw Moses and the prophet Elijah there with Jesus. And they were talking with him. There they are. Moses, through whom God gave the law. The law being the Ten Commandments and all those various minor laws that sprang from the Ten Commandments. Those laws that governed the lives of the Jews, the people of God, from the time they were revealed to that day. And there he is, Elijah, the greatest of the prophets that God had sent to guide God's people until that day. And there they are, talking with Jesus. They're in dialogue with Jesus. And you know, I suspect, seeing them all together, I think that's what's behind Peter's words when he witnessed that gathering. And he said, let me make three tents of honor for each of you. Because I think Peter, in his fear, his being so awed and overwhelmed, I think Peter misinterpreted the situation at first that the three figures were equal, that Moses, Elijah, and Jesus were somehow all on the same level, great rabbis or great teachers, great leaders. And so then for a few minutes, poor, terrified Peter, James, and John, well, they are in a cloud. They're in a cloud of unknowing, uncertainty. They are in a cloud of fear. And the full truth is obscured by that cloud, that cloud of unknowing and uncertainty and fear. And that's when they hear that powerful voice and the cloud disappears, poof. And along with it, they see that Elijah and Moses have disappeared too. And all that's left is Jesus. That's a hugely telling moment. That is a huge revelation. It isn't that Moses and Elijah are unimportant. It is that what they signify has now been fulfilled by Jesus. What's left standing is Jesus. Jesus alone. Set apart from being just a great teacher or a great leader. Here before them is a new thing. Here now revealed in this very moment is the new thing that God has promised. The new thing that God is doing. The new thing that they had been told to prepare for. Now the law and the prophets were the way that God had revealed himself and his will to his people. But now the law and the prophets have been fulfilled. And here revealed before them, revealed to us, is the living revelation of God. And the voice of God booms to the disciples, this is my son. Listen to him. The voice of God booms to us. This Jesus is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Not to all the powers of the world. Not to voices from the past. Not to deceivers and false prophets. Not to the wizards, but to Jesus. Oh, and how the disciples are transformed How could they not have been when this great truth was revealed to them? They leave that place and they come down from that mountaintop experience and they come down to move forward then, to move forward in their work, which is the ministry of Jesus, to move forward as followers and doers, shaken awake, shaken awake in a profound way, shaken awake to reality. Beth Page, this morning, we are called to no less than they were. We are called to be transformed. We are called to be transformed in light of the truth that has been revealed to us. That this Jesus is the Son of God and what we must do is listen to him 
The truth is that we must follow him. The disciples were transformed by the revelation of who Jesus is. And in that light, they saw clearly, by contrast, exactly who they were too. Who they really were. And the reality of their situation. That was the disciples' pivotal moment. And it must be ours too. It must be our pivotal moment. In the light of Jesus, we see who we are. We are faced with the call to look at ourselves for who we truly are. We are faced with the call to dare to look and see and to accept the truth. And that's particularly important this morning as we approach our annual meeting, a meeting at which we will first review our present situation and then we're going to elect those who will help to serve us first to choose our fellow members for consideration of new elders who will continue to lead us and guide us. We're at a reckoning point and we have to look without self-deception, we have to look without malice, and we have to look without nostalgia, without nostalgia, We must look at who we are right now. And we must look at who we want to be. And we will do that in the light of the truth of who Jesus is. And we will choose whether or not we will be bound by the things of the past, bound by them, tied down by them, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, otherwise glorious, or if we will let go of them. And listen, for the new thing, the new thing that God is doing. And we will choose if we will have the courage to follow Jesus. And have the courage, like the disciples, to get down to work. That sometimes challenging, sometimes hard, sometimes scary work of Jesus. It may make us tremble a bit like the disciples. It may make us tremble a bit in the revelations of the excitement and of the differences in our lives that that calls for. It may be scary. It may be scary because it may be new and unknown. But we know, we know that it will be the good thing, the right thing. And we know that all will be well Because if we choose to listen to God's beloved Son, Jesus, and if we choose to follow Him, the light of Jesus will guide our way. In the light of Jesus, all other powers fall away. In the light of Jesus, the forces and the voices that would distract us and keep us enmeshed in negativity or other things, they all lose their steam. Poof. The power of the true light vanquishes the dark clouds. So as we pivot this morning to the next thing, our task is still to get ready. Our task is still to keep watch for the next amazing thing, the next astonishing thing that God will do and that God will do in our lives and our lives together as a church. Our task is to listen, to follow, and to do. Our task is to enter the whole new world that God is opening up for us. May it be so. Amen.